Hello and welcome back to our regular Sunday History series. This is the second in our two-part examination of the political engine that comes to exist in the territory that we describe as modern-day Israel on Jordan and includes parts of Syria, including Damascus. Now what I asked you to do in the first video was to disregard modern borders and to look at this territory as geography. So this is a territory that links several distinct geographical kind of territories. It links the Arabian Peninsula, you can get down to Africa through here, it's adjacent to the Mediterranean, but it's also linked onto the Eurasian steppe, both the lowlands and the highlands, which means that it becomes a center point coordinating and providing governance and a center of political organization for territories, which literally reach from Britannia to the outer edges of Siberia down to the Indus Valley down to the west coast of Africa. Now what I talked about in the first kind of video was how learning about instability on the Fertile Crescent had led to the actual creation of this political engine. These were people who understood that this would be contested territory. They divide the territory into two. Canaan is the land on the side of the valley which is adjacent to the Mediterranean. The curse of Canaan means it will always be subject to its brother. It offers a front face to civilizations who are not part of this political and economic engine, almost a dummy or a dupe to protect this other site, Kadesh, which exists behind the veil of the Jordan Valley in a mountain fortress, the Holy Mountain. Now, the side of the valley that we call Canaan was incredibly important in its own right, and the modern archaeologists who were chasing biblical stories actually missed the point of how significant this land was. A series of cities emerge on the coast of this territory, which are centers, they are sacred centers, they are centers of technology, they are centers of trade, and they are incredibly desirable and incredibly, incredibly prosperous. But this side of the valley is presented, you can see in the place names which change rapidly and are often changed to suit kind of various powers who are vying for dominance. This provides a front face to protect this more important site, which now is evidenced in the ruins of Petra, Kadesh, Holy Mountain, Mount Sin, which, and Salem, which later becomes Jerusalem and Mount Sinai. Now, within the ruins at Petra, what you have is evidence, like, the problem is that the preoccupation around biblical stories is about people with the Abrahamic face at their root, but what we're seeking to understand is the political and economic organization of these territories. In Christopher Beckwith's book, A History of the, the Peoples of the Eurasian Steppe, he gives you, he calls this the Eurasian culture complex, all these different civilizations with roots on the steppe. He describes envy at the political organization and principles by in the times of Confucian from China. By being able to put the site, the ruins that Petra evidences over thousands of years in this context, what you get a jigsaw is a jigsaw piece which allows you to understand the political and economic organization and the belief systems that spread, including the sacred belief systems across territories. The notion of monotheism that we have in the modern world is not borne out by the archaeological evidence. In actual fact, you know, this is a site where, you know, monotheism is about the submission to the fact that we are part of one system, to the overarching principles of being in one system. Most pantheons have an overarching living force and a god and then a number of gods and goddesses that are applicable to day-to-day -day human life. We're going to talk in the discussion of Egypt next week the way this manifests at the center of systems of governance. But what's represented by this geography and this site is a recognition that we are one system. At the core of the site at Petra, when it was first discovered, people thought it was a city of the dead. There were so many tombs and funerary monuments that they thought it must just be a city of the dead, but it's actually the, the, the tombs and the monuments at the core of this city which provide its engine of political cooperation. Ancestor worship defines almost every ancient belief system. You are talking about nomadic peoples who may not have the infrastructure, and so a city where their ancestors can be buried 
is a massively important thing. The story of Egyptian civilization is of the desecration of ancestral monuments and trying to keep the, the, the remains of your ancestors safe. What Petra provides is evidence of how these this central, like the, the tombs and the monuments actually provide the core of the economic system that it then generates. The funerary monuments which, dot, which ring the site in, li, in Islamic tradition, you can see that what would happen is when you kind of cross the boundary created by these monuments, you entered into a holy city, the city where your ancestors and those of the other people kind of joined with you at this city are buried. The conflicts that define the rest of your life are left at the door because this is a holy city. In Josephus in the first century, he's writing and referring back to Moses carrying out um, rituals that we associate with the modern Hajj, which are very much the rituals which Muhammad kind of placed at the core of Islam, which are about the fact that when you enter this city, it is a holy place. In biblical texts, a holy place is separate. Once you start excluding people or denying people the ability to bury their dead or whatever, it ceases to be a holy place because you have made sure that the same conflicts that define everybody else define this place. A holy place is separate from this. Now, within kind of the ruins at Petra and within kind of what we're seeing kind of in the descriptions of the Eurasian culture complex by Christopher Beckwith, what you see is a system of political and economic organization which is actually relatively familiar. This is a trading oasis. This continues to be a wildly successful trading oasis. It reaches its heights in the first century. The ruins at Petra evidence that there are influences from multiple civilizations. At the core of the site are the anionic monuments. There are no images of gods at the core covenant of the site, but the site itself is able to accommodate lots and lots and lots of influences. The Nabataean style is a core Sumerian structure which is able to accommodate lots and lots of other styles, however superficially. Now what's described in the Josephus history is going back to the period that he describes as Moses and we're going to discuss how to use the stories of Exodus to give you insight into the Bronze Age collapse and Egyptian civilization next week. But he describes a system of taxes and, and tithes a central tithe to pay for the festivals, a tithe to pay for welfare. The welfare functions are central to this. It's depicted in the Book of Ruth. Um, the Children of Moab is about the, the responsibility to children. The she-camel parable in the um, Quran referring to this site is about this central principle of welfare for women and children. This is one tithe. There is a tithe to pay for festivals and gatherings, which prove, you know, Peter Frankopan in his book The Silk Roads describes the trade fairs that would occur here kind of thrice yearly, the roots of which are described in the Josephus histories with reference to Moses. Now, What's also here at the core of it is a sacred complex. These are the ruins at Petra are temples. They are huge, enormous temple complexes. And the system that's emerged from way back at ancient Sumeria with these high priestesses central remains central to this. But this is linked to female power through the harem function. Now, I'm with Fatima Manessi on the brutality of the harems for women under the Islamic Empire, and particularly the Ottoman Empire is really, really interesting. But the roots of that is a response against this earlier system where this was a system of female power. In next week's video, we're going to talk about Egypt and Nubia, and we're going to talk about the impact of having subordinated wives from multiple civilizations in a political network within this site. Many of the peace treaties, diplomacies, they are written by women. Where there's a war, there's a wedding is the story of dynastic development, but that power base is generated, is maintained here. The documents for Babatha's orchard, which are about the date orchards that were cultivated, show that the date orchards at the center of this site were, symptom, were symbols of female independence, as well as being at the center of sacred practice. 
Now the reason I'm giving out like I'm this video is very much about giving you an insight into the structure of this political engine because this is not a political engine whose story can be told within the actual story of the city itself. That would be impossible. But the reason the video has to go here in the series is that for every subsequent civilization afterwards, you have to understand the existence of this political engine, of this strip of land, Canaan, as the dummy for civilizations who are not part of it, of this city here as a center of political organization for an extraordinary span of territories. And as we go through to look at the Bronze Age collapse and the civilizations that emerge from it, the Phoenicians, it's actually understanding the maritime network that's coordinated from here, which is central to understanding that, as well as the territories that kind of are impacted by the Bronze Age collapse. Understanding the emergence of the Carthaginian Empire and the relationship between the Carthaginian Empire and this center is important for understanding the economic organization of the antique world. Through the stories of Solomon and Sheba, we need to understand that to understand the development of Axum and the Ethiopian kind of economic and political power base that I'm actually going to discuss in the videos next week. It's actually understanding the significance of this political engine in binding all these territories that explains why the Romans were so desperate to get access to it. But in order to understand, like, you have to understand periods in Jewish history that are related to this site, including the exile and the seriousness of it and the impact of Assyrians attempting to dominate this site. You have to understand that at the very least to understand the rise of the Persians and the rise of Cyrus the Great and the territories that he banned to understand that this is pre-existing relationships that have grown over time that then form the basis of his empire. Then you have to understand the existence of this site to understand the rise of Alexander the Great. You have to understand what this site did to understand the chaos caused by the wars of the Diadochi and his successors in those territories. This gives insight into the rise of the Roman Empire and the events of the first century, which included what appears to have been a full-scale war which changed the course of the Roman Empire. It is the absence of this political engine that allows you to understand why this strip of land for the past 2,000 years has been the source of nothing but conflict. And it's the absence of this political engine that allows you to understand what the Parthians were doing when they were trying to generate kind of what we consider in the West the opening of the Silk Roads was actually the Parthians kind of taking on responsibility for this in a period where the absence of this engine created weakness that allowed tensions to flare between the Han Dynasty and Rome. It's the absence of this political engine that allows you to understand the significance of Bactria later on and the territories bound under the Islamic Empire. So this is not a video giving you the history of this site, although I think Abraham represents kind of a king who existed in about 1600 BC, and we know that it was about 400 years to the Battle of Kadesh. There's 400 years between the stories of Sakiyaha and the Bronze Age collapse, which kind of center around the political governance that this site forms. But it's actually understanding the depth of this political engine and the way that it uses the contested nature of the land that allows you to understand the horrendous mistakes that we have made in the modern world. Now in other videos I talk a lot about day one of modern economics is kind of World War I and the Treaty of Versailles. And there's nowhere more true, this is more true than this strip of land. Many of the national borders and the problems that are currently playing out here are nothing to do with Holy Covenant. The actual Holy Covenant that's kind of referenced in the Bible that represents this political engine is actually held in Ethiopia from 600 BC from the stories of Solomon and Sheba. And the period covered from Solomon to Jehoiakim is actually very, very important for world history. And the events of the Jewish exile are incredibly important. But the Holy Covenant was held in Ethiopia from 600 BC. And what you're dealing with in the Middle East is a failure to understand what actually was very, very clear to people in antiquity, which is that this land will always be contested. 
and that without an engine of political cooperation and governance here, man's tendency to conflict will take over. The national boundaries that are at play now in the Middle East are formed as a result of the consequences of World War I and II and are still playing out with horrific consequences. Now, what I'm going to do next week is I'm going to come back and we're going to discuss, we're going to discuss Egypt and Nubia. And I, like, they, these are identities that are interplay and develop together and then separately. And the civilizations that they develop here are incredibly important, but can actually only be understood if you incorporate the existence of this site. And this is the case for each subsequent civilization that we're going to look at. The week after, I'm going to look at Turkey. And the week after, I'm actually going to look at Syria. But it's understanding kind of the development of this engine and the existence of it that allows you to kind of put the piece of the jigsaw in place, that allows you to see the kind of development of the rest of civilization afterwards. Thank you very much for sticking with me today. Um, I will be back on Wednesday to look at how the global context has changed while we've been funny about with Brexit. And I'll be back next Sunday with our look at Egypt and Nubia.